Welcome back to the Global Startup Movement. I'm your host, Andrew Berkowitz. Today, we have a very special episode for you featuring one of the great entrepreneurs in the Nigerian tech ecosystem, Tayo Oviosu, the CEO and founder of Paga. Tayo is working to provide universal access to financial services throughout Nigeria and Africa, allowing consumers to send money to anyone with a mobile phone. Paga has raised capital from the likes of Tim Draper, the Amidiar Network, and Acumen, just to name a few, and now has a larger reach in Nigeria than all of the Nigerian banks combined. On this episode, Tao gives us insight into lessons learned while building Paga, as well as insight to how he thinks about angel investing as a founder. If you're not already subscribed to the podcast, be sure to hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app to ensure you never miss an episode. And now, here's my interview with Tayo Oviosu, the CEO and founder of Paga. Entrepreneurship has become a global phenomenon. Uncover the stories of entrepreneurs and investors worldwide, from Sub-Saharan Africa to Silicon Valley and beyond, here on the Global Startup Movement. Now, here's your host, Andrew Berkowitz. All right. So, Teo, it is great to have you on the show. I've been following you for um, about a year now, mainly through Twitter. And so it's, uh, it, it's great to finally have you on. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's a pleasure to, to be here. I appreciate you uh, reaching out. Yeah, no problem. Really enjoyed your, your panel or, or your talk at the Africa FinTech Summit. And so what, why don't you start us off just kind of uh, re- really quickly with the story of how Paga came to be? Yeah. So I started Paga in 2009 after I moved back to Nigeria from the US. And, and really, the idea came from my own frustration carrying cash everywhere. You know, I was banked with multiple banks, but finding a point of sale device to pay for transactions was difficult. ATMs, you always got errors. And I said, you know, there's got to be a better way to pay and get paid. I have two mobile phones and I have signal in different places. I have internet connection. Why couldn't I? using something similar to a PayPal, right? And that's really what got me started. And as I, as I did some desktop research, I quickly found that actually most Nigerians have a worse problem than I do, or than I did, and most are not banked. So we're a country of 180 million people, and we have somewhere about 70 million unbanked slash underbanked people. And so we're a very cash-driven society and said, you know, we've got to solve those problems. So we have to, I think, solve two problems fundamentally. One is how do we make it easy to send money to people or to send money to use to pay for goods and services? And the second is how do you deliver financial services to the mass market and, you know, actually bring people into the formal financial service sphere? And I think these are two fundamental problems that any country has to address if you want to really solve and bring people out of poverty and, and help the country actually progress. So yeah, so that's how Paga started. I bootstrapped it for the first six months before I started raising angel money. And um, we eventually launched to the public in 2012. Um, and so it's been about a little over five years plus um, driving the business. And we're very excited about what we've achieved so far and the future ahead of us. So I know your your headquarters in Nigeria is is based in Lagos in the in the Yaba neighborhood. And so, can you talk to us a little bit about that that neighborhood? You know, I know it's kind of emerged as a, a center for a lot of the startup activity in Lagos, but has had challenges with its infrastructure. And I I think I remember reading about Andela and and maybe Conga as well moving across town after they both raised larger rounds. Yeah, it's very interesting actually because um, when we when when I started Paga, Yaba maybe had one tech company here, and it wasn't a destination at all for any startup. And we were looking for an office, and one day I just said, you know what? I'm going to go to Yaba and check it out, right? Why pay all this money on the islands of Lagos? They're very expensive. And so I came down here on a Saturday, drove around with an estate agent, didn't really see anything I liked. And then as I was about leaving, I saw this building. And I'm like, hey, that building has a for rent sign. Why didn't, you, why didn't we check that one out? So we, we, we turned around and we went back there. And long story short, you know, we got the bill, we got the floor in the building. 
um, and we moved here. And so we were actually of the young, new generation startups in Nigeria. We were the first um, on the street. You know, we started with one floor and now we have three floors in this building and we're looking to take the other two floors that are coming available in the middle of this year. And I remember Simdul from Conga calling me about, you know, okay, you guys are in, in Yaba now, what do you think? You know, and I'm like, yeah, you know, it's actually fairly central and for staff, it works very well because people coming from the mainland of Lagos or from the islands, you can easily get here, you're opposing traffic. And for us, we work with the banks a lot. It's very close for us to pop over to the bank headquarters uh, for various banks. So, so it's been great to see the Yaba Equus tech ecosystem develop and more startups come here and, and actually, you know, because rents are fairly cheap here still. Um, and it was great to see the minister, you know, the CC hub come and be based here, the idea hub. Now the first Facebook hub um, in Nigeria is based on the street as well. And, and the minister of tech and comms at the time, you know, also took an effort with the state government to help us ensure fiber uh, be laid on the street. So we now have Main One, who's a fiber provider, has laid high speed fiber on the street. And so it's easy for me. I actually rather have internet calls than use my cell phone in this building. <laughs> and, and so I think all of that was really positive, especially for those of us that are on the main stretch of the road, which is called Herbert Macaulay. For people who are off the main road, they may not have had the same fiber access or it may have to be pulled over to them. Uh, but the one downside to Yaba buildings, uh, which is why actually some of the companies you mentioned moved out, is because the buildings were originally, a lot of the buildings were not built for com commerce initially, right? Um, or were not built in ways that allowed you to structure your, your team layout the way you would like to. Right. So we have three floors here, about to get two more, but I, you know, but I know that the layout we would love to have is not what we have. Right. And so people opted or are opting and we're thinking about it as well for more of a warehouse type of feel where you can actually divide and lay things out a bit better um, to, to your building. So I'm still hoping we stay in Yaba um, and, and figure something in this area. Um, because the, the location is perfect. Um, and it's also been great just from an ecosystem point of view, right? Um, once a month, the tech ecosystem, people meet in different, um, in different people's offices and just have, you know, a catch up, um, share ideas, what's going on, what's working, what's not. Um, and and, um, and I think that camaraderie is also very, very helpful to the ecosystem. Right. Absolutely. And so I'd be curious to hear, you know, when you when you look back on the different fundraising rounds that you've done for Paga, what have been your biggest lessons learned when it comes to fundraising for a, a Nigerian startup? Uh, and, you know, l looking back, what round would you say was the hardest one to raise? Wow. Which one was the hardest one to raise? They're, I think they've all been very hard. Uh, so and I, and I, you know, I wonder if it gets easier. So, you know, look, I, I fundamentally say to people that Paga has been the exception, not the rule. For as hard as I, I feel it's been for us, um, we've been very fortunate, right? Raising money here, there are many challenges, and it starts even at the angel capital. When I started Paga, there were very few, if any, people who invested in startups as angels. Today, we have a lot more potential angels, and people are, are doing that more. But still, it's hard for people to raise angel angel money because you know while there's wealth in Nigeria, a lot of the wealthy Nigerians still invest in their own projects and are not yet used to the idea of investing in another person and letting that person go run that business on their own. Uh, so, so that so that still remains a challenge for, for for people. But if you're able to get past that, then I think you are probably able to get to a Series A. And then beyond the Series A, then I think raising that 10 to $20 million, there's still a gap there. Because a lot of the companies that can invest 10 to $20 million, the private equity funds, are looking for larger companies that are already profitable. And have been profitable for a while in this market. And so that makes it challenging to find the people that can write that kind of check. So the example I give with Paga is if you look at our cap table, we have 34 angel investors 
in our cap table. And we have six institutional investors. And we're in the process to close another financing now where we'll be adding a seventh institutional investor. That is a lot of people to deal with when you're collecting signatures. <laughs> and I think that just goes to show the challenge of raising money in this, con- in, in this country and this continent in general, right? But it also shows the opportunity, right? Because if I take a Tim Draper, who was the first big name investor that Paga had, knock on wood, when we give Tim a wonderful return on his money, and I know we've more than already 10 x his money in value, when we give him a return on his money, he's going to be able to preach, preach the message of the opportunity of Nigeria, right? And that's sort of, you know, we need more people like Tim who say, I believe in the long-term picture here, and I'm going to take early bets um, and invest in entrepreneurs and ideas in this market that um, have, have legs. Definitely. And as a, I, I know you're trying to solve that problem as well by a- actively making angel investments. And so I'd be curious to hear as a founder that, that is actively you know, making these investments while you're building your company. I mean, h- how do you think about constructing your angel portfolio? And you know, I'm, I'm curious as to what sort of deal flow are, are you looking to specialize in? Like, are you looking for uh, you know, synergy for Paga, or is it just kind of you believe in the entrepreneur, you believe in Nigeria, and and you, and you want to help you know by, by making these small angel checks? Yeah, I know it's it's a really good question. Um, first of all, for me, I mean, me angel investing is a hobby, right? Because I, you know, it's not something I can do full time. Because I'm, oh, oh, uh, I'm, I'm, my hands are very full. Um, but I, I look at it as me fundamentally having a structured way to give back. Right, um, and saying that you know, for good or bad, a number of people reach out to me to provide advice, and a lot of times I may not have the kind of time to put in that I would like to. And so, by me angel investing, it's saying I'm picking a handful of companies that I'm actually going to spend some quality time with and and help them through their process and their journey. And the way we've gone about it is myself and a friend have pulled together, I think in total there are nine of us who formed a club and and we've raised a you know, small amount of money that we are we're then using to invest in, in, a, in a handful of deals and we've just done our first deal and the way we think about the portfolio of companies we're looking at is I'm heavily invested personally in tech already through Paga and so I'm sort of, if I think of my own personal portfolio, I'm overweight already in tech so we're actually consciously we're looking at non-tech, but tech enabled is fine, right? So the first deal we did is in a pharmacy retail chain. And this is a company that was started by two ex bank consultant guys who um, basically are looking at solving the two big problems that we have um, in pharmacy retail in Nigeria. One is, you know, there's a huge problem with fake drugs. And then the second is the fact that because almost everywhere you see a pharmacy, it's a mom and pop, you know, it means that cost for them to negotiate, they don't have buying power, right? And so cost of drugs are also high. And then you have fake drugs. And so they said, look, we can solve this problem and we will do it by A, building a brand, um, a pharmacy retail brand, and then franchising um, and pulling people together. And they've gone ahead and started Right? And these are two entrepreneurs that are very dogged and we're very excited about them. And so that's, you know, we think healthcare is just a big area where there are issues in Nigeria anyways. And so we're very excited about that company and, and what they're doing. It's called Life Stores. And so, you know, we're, we're going to pour our time and energy to help them uh, however we can. Um, so, so the way I think about it, we've thought about it, is we've thought of certain sectors that we like, that we think they are real problems to go solve that are demand ready. In the, in, in, in the market and that can scale across Nigeria, but hopefully also beyond Nigeria, right? And so that's the first one. The second one we're looking at is a tomato processing company called Tomato Joss. Very excited about the entrepreneur there as well. And, you know, Nigeria, if you've ever been to Nigeria, almost everything we eat is tomato based. And we grow actually about, I think 60% of tomatoes in West Africa are grown in Nigeria. 
but we import uh, tomato paste and we waste a lot of our fresh tomatoes. And so why are we not processing in Nigeria? And so she started out on this journey. And this is very interesting. It's a white, white American woman who, you know, lives in northern Nigeria uh, and has just poured her life and soul into, into this business. Uh, so we're very excited about that as well. So agriculture is another area that we find very interesting. And so, yeah, well, we're also looking at some tech-related opportunities. In general, we're looking at non-tech uh, because of the overweight on the tech side for me in particular. Yeah, and, and that makes sense. And, and, and what you just said there, I've seen a lot of... Uh... You know, I think there's a lot of value to be created within African markets with focusing more so on the processing because there, there's so many raw materials, raw commodities that get exported. And then a lot of the value add of the, the processing stage happens in, you know, in Southeast Asia or, or other areas of the world. Yeah. And then it's, then it's imported back, right? Exactly. <laughs> so so it's, it's actually, I mean, and this agribond would be the second agri opportunity I would you know, look at personally, right? I mean, the same, it's the same story on fruits, right? With dry, dry fruits, which is what actually my wife is doing. Um, right. You know, we produce all of these fruits um, and people, you know, goes to waste, right? Um, and, and there's an opportunity to export the dry fruit um, as well as to use it locally and it's also healthier, etc. So you can see that in so many different places, right? In so many different parts of the value chain where you say, why are we not doing these things locally? And there's already a clear, clear demand for, for these products. So that's something that we're very keen to, to look at and say, like, how can we help um, in these markets? And then when I think of, you know, just sort of being an angel investor, it's like, how do we make it easy or easier for entrepreneurs to raise money on the entire value chain from, from seed all the way to series A, B, C, right, and on. Um, and so part of what I want my life mission to be is to help solve that problem, right? And so I see what I'm doing now as just the beginning um, of that. Right. And, and specifically with that problem, I know you said before that U.S. accelerators and, and you know, international investors shouldn't really be investing in Nigeria without ground knowledge and without finding, you know, a, a local partner. And so, you know, I, I want you to elaborate more on, on your thinking around that because I do think that's an important truth for not just Nigeria, but, but for a lot of African markets where I think a lot of people underestimate the difficulties around like the localization factor and, and the local cultures and, you know, what works differently in Africa. So, so can you elaborate a little bit that, on that? Yeah. So, I mean, and, and, I, and I actually got a bit of flack for, 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 for that post. When I said that, what I mean is the following. Again, if I go back to that Tim Draper example, if Tim Draper does not make money out of investing in Pugna, he's going to have a horrible story to tell, right? And if he doesn't see Pugna being successful, he's not going to have a great story to tell people to go back and invest here. So especially in the early days of any ecosystem, it is critical that the initial international investors that come in have a good experience, even if it's not a great experience, right? Um, and it is important that they um, get to understand the market, that they know the entrepreneurs, that they know the challenges of the, of the market. And that's very tough to do when you're sitting in the in Silicon Valley, right? And trying to understand Lagos, which is so far away, right? Um, but someone can come to you in Silicon Valley and present to you uh, anything, right? And speak fluent English with American accent uh, and went to similar schools as you did and, and really just blow you away, right? Um, without you realizing that on the ground, actually, that's not that business idea, which sounds great, is actually not as feasible, right? Or for various reasons, or it's not uh, going to be as easily executable as being, as being um, projected. Now, I think that the, where those investors who are smart, what they would do is actually not only come on the ground themselves to see it and understand it, but actually find other like-minded investors or entrepreneurs in the market who or other experts who know the market well and partner with them. And, you know, there actually are some companies set up to really help with this. Some companies such as Ingressive that has done the, you know, the tech tours with 500 startups and they, and they bring people and entrepreneur, you know, um, angel investors to the market to come and understand what's going on, see for themselves. You know, I've seen the likes of Steve Case. He's, he's done this as well, came on the ground, 
spent quite a bit of time and then keeps in touch as well with, with the entrepreneurs he's met to just get better understanding and sense of the market. He's done no deal yet, uh, to the best of my knowledge, in, say, Nigeria. I think he may be invested in one other company on the continent. But I think over time, as he understands the market better, as he talks to people, he'll be in a better informed place, right? And I think that's really what I'm saying is that, you know, if if the international investors are in a better informed place by working with people on the ground, then they have a greater likelihood that the deals they invest in, they will do well. And that is a good thing for the ecosystem. And so that's really just sort of a point that I'm making. For the ecosystem, it's in our, all our interests that the initial investors do very well. Yeah, I completely agree. Because I mean, it's it's easy to get romantic about raising capital and, and, and making those headlines. But at the end of the day, if you're not building a sustainable business in the long run, it's going to hurt the ecosystem. Whereas that great dopamine hit you get when, when that headline goes out that you raise this capital is, is great in the short term. But you know, sustain, right. sustainability is important. Absolutely. Tay, I, I see we're coming up on time. Do you maybe want to finish us off? I would love to hear just kind of 30 seconds real quick. Uh, what, what's your favorite thing about uh, being in Lagos? Look, I think the, the uh, opportunity to do something that is truly impactful, right? Um, and that's what gets me up every day um, because, you know, I just had a session with, uh, you know, some of the new employees here at Paga and I, I was sharing with them that, you know, if, if we're half as successful as I could imagine, um, we would have had significant impact on this country and we already are having Right, whether it's in the um, making life easy for people. I'm looking outside the window right now and I see about six people in line at, at a bank, right? We want to stop that, right? Um, and making it easy for people to transact, for creating jobs um, and the opportunity that, that we have here, right? So if I wasn't Nigerian, I actually would be here um, because I think Nigeria is the next frontier, um, you know, with all due respect to every other African country. Uh, this is going to be the third largest country in the world by 2030, and it's going to be the second largest country in the world by 2100, larger than China. Uh, and it's a big deal. Um, and I think anyone who is um, who wants to be part of that growth and that uh, opportunity um, and the upside of it needs to be here. Awesome. Well, thanks again for your time, Teo. Andrew, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thanks for listening. Be sure to add Andrew on Snapchat at andberk, that's A-N-D-B-E-R-K, to see firsthand a day in the life of an entrepreneur in cities all around the world.